Michael, our uh, Michael, our sincere apologies for the delay. We have been in the thick of it on uh, a number of different bills, but we're so glad that you're able to join us. Hello. Uh, did you did you hear our apology? I I think I missed it because uh, I was uh, I I didn't want to come on and I was uh, distracted. All right. So thank you. Uh, my apology for the delay. No problem. No problem. Uh, we have been in the thick of a different bill. As you know, this is that time of year, but we're, we're shifting gears now to look at school construction. Uh, and one of our colleagues on the committee thought it would be particularly helpful to hear from all of you. Um, you in particular on, again, H871. We probably have about oh, 15 or so minutes. I don't know if you can keep it high level at, uh, for about 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll ask some questions as we go along. Sounds great. So for the record, I'm Michael Gaughan, the executive director of the Vermont Bond Bank. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I did send some materials. I don't know if they made their way. We do have them and they're printed out right in front of us. Okay, terrific. Um, so sure. I'm really just going to speak to, um, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've met most of you. Um, the bond bank, uh, just as way of introduction, is 100% uh, um, uh, aligned with or our history is that is that of school facilities in Vermont. Our reason for being formed in, in the late 60s was because of school construction and Fast forward a little over 50 years, uh, all those schools we help finance are now at the end of their useful life. So we're very invested in this issue and, and its solutions. Um, so on page three, I was very happy to see H71 incorporate many things that were uh, a priority to us. I think, you know, a few folks there were, were members of the task force that worked throughout the summer and fall. And I think that we um, have a great structure uh, through that effort to think about how aid can be um, released to school districts without um, sort of hurting the, the state's credit rating. But I think the bottom line there for all of you to be aware of is that if we can leverage the state's credit rating uh, through the bond bank, um, we can in fact leverage the state's credit rating. We, we can probably take on more debt at the bond bank than can, well, absolutely the bond bank can take on more school construction debt than can the state. And so preserving the state's rating is kind of the key piece to all this to keep costs low. So um, our rating is a derivative of the state, but the debt that we issue doesn't uh, impact the state directly. And we've done a lot of work since 2020 to make sure that the state is insulated from the amount of uh, debt that we um, that we issue. So uh, I just you know just know that as a as a founding concept. Um, one of the points here, second on the list, schools are social infrastructure with and without students. Again, very pleased to see this concept incorporated. Uh, housing and social infrastructure are brought out um, directly in the uh, in 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 H seven one, and and we couldn't be happier about that because I think when you make it a zero sum game in the event of consolidation or moving facilities around, uh, that's the only piece of social infrastructure in that community, and ultimately that's a kind of a death sentence for a bond vote. Um, so, uh, I think I've covered the main sources, I guess, for all of you to be aware of the, the task force members know this, but we are actively pursuing as many low cost sources of financing as we can. Um, the IIJA was very helpful from a hard infrastructure perspective, uh, the, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law, but was not, um, particularly helpful for facilities. So the question is like how we shoehorn in those sources. And, and the main one we're looking at is um, dollars related to the Inflation Reduction Act. So um, the, the something called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, major awardees were announced last week from EPA. Uh, one of our partners, Climate United, received a, a $7 billion grant and uh, they will be looking to do K through 12 school renovation for energy efficiency purposes um, and are devoting uh, somewhere between 300 million and 500 million to that effort. So long story short, um, as you think through the criteria in the future, um, you know, I think it's important to optimize capital where appropriate. So rather than giving aid for things like energy efficiency, although it's really important, um, optimizing sources so that we can do that on a low cost basis and, 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 and you know, directing the aid towards things that are um, not otherwise funded is important. 
So that's all on background. And uh, what I did want to spend um, a few minutes about is actually on page four. Um, and the rest of the deck really is is on is background for you on both the history of school construction, which we see because our our um, me, because we finance so many of the transactions historically, other than Winooski School District in Burlington, we've financed basically everything in the state over the last 50 years. Um, and then we have some background for you there on um, different method, methods of credit enhancement and um, equitable access to financing. And the, so the sort of punchline in, and the good news is that because of the bond bank, um, a lot of the problems that other states would have in thinking about solutions to this problem, um, you don't have to worry about. But specifically as it relates to H71 and uh, also thinking about, you know, all that's transpired in education finance uh, this this past year, um, we at the Bond Bank and in my own personal background is is varied in in um, in different types of finance, and um, we're we're aware of other methods of finance and project delivery that exists, uh, you know, throughout the country. And so I think really, as I read through the language, and I haven't looked at it in a few months, but as I looked at it again yesterday, and thought about it in the context of how much uh, construction we need to undertake, and the pressures that are facing the Ed Fund and schools generally, I think it really suggests an approach that is as creative as possible and doesn't close a door on anything that might be helpful. So for that reason, I would suggest, um, I think H71 is great generally, but I would suggest a couple additions. So um, I think on section three, the pre-qualified architecture and engineering consultants, what this, uh, I think the subtext of this provision is really that new school construction will follow a very conventional process of design, bid, build. And uh, much like VTrans has, uh, you know, there are other methods of project delivery, um, design build, um, and then a whole host of other types uh, of mechanisms. And so while I don't necessarily know whether or not that's the right answer for Vermont, as we sort of set the conditions of school construction um, for the future under this bill, I think we should add, we should provide the resources to explore all options. So I would suggest adding to the pre-qualifications also um, alternative project delivery consultants uh, that have expertise in design, build, and design, build, operate, maintain structures that can be used for physical and social infrastructure. And this is a method of procurement that um, VTrans, like I mentioned before, has explored extensively um, from what I can tell, and in fact is using for their EV charging network um, that they've just sent out an uh, RFP for. So it's not um, completely outside the box in the Vermont context. And then going down to the efficiency section, I think the whole idea here is to gain efficiencies from uh, a potential alternative um, project delivery uh, methodology. And so, I would suggest adding to the cost containment strategy, um, not just templates for new construction, but um, thinking around, again, alternative project delivery and um, consideration of uh, various risk transfer strategies um, that may be public to public private partner or partnerships or maybe uh, public to private partnerships that can help um, alleviate some of, the, um, some of the risk involved in uh, new construction. So uh, that's uh, that's kind of my punchline. Um, probably yeah, no, like... that's, that's very helpful. I'm just looking for the committee to respond to those yep. questions, uh, concerns, uh, any opposition to making those edits. I don't. Sorry. Okay. How does Michael feel about being part of the the group? Do you hear that question, Senator? Yeah. Gilles? No, I I'd, I'd be happy to do so. I think I'd. Um... As it develops, I'll, I'll I'll probably seek out ways to comment one way or the other. So I'm happy okay, to be well, included. Do you have a follow-up, Senator Kulikow? Okay. So to an earlier point, perhaps the treasurer and the bond bank, as far as the reference group, I mean, it's just a reference group. It's a consulted group. A consulted group. But then it says that the bond will list anyone who needs a group. Yeah, financing is... 
very well. So consulting with uh, the bond bank and the treasurer's office. So the, the bond bank, where in the state government hierarchy is the bond bank? Who do you we are your child. So we're an instrumentality of the state um, created by the General Assembly and our um, our board is appointed by the governor and the treasurer sits ex officio on it. So to actually just we, go ahead. Please yeah, go I was going to say we have our own contracts, though, which is why our debt is is um, separate from that of the states. Many questions or concerns with adding the language put forward by uh, Michael. Do I pronounce your last? How do I pronounce your last name? So I don't mispronounce yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, gone, just like a G O N E. Got it. Uh, from Mr. Gone, or the two suggestions uh, put or the suggestion put forward by Senator Weeks to add the Vermont Bank, Bond Bank, and the Treasurer's Office to the groups uh, to be consulted. Okay. Great. Any other, uh, Mr. Gone? Anything else you'd like to highlight or add? No, I just a number to, of things to review. Yeah, I know you all are focused on a lot of really difficult issues, but would just advocate for continuing to stay focused on this issue. It's a, um, you know, it's a huge unmet liability for us, and um, uh, I think not to be ignored is that the school facilities issue crosses over to many state goals such as um, population growth, attraction of of people and, and various other things um, that I think can get lost in the weeds in, in terms of focusing on the dollars and cents. But, you know, we can't attract new people, younger people, unless we have uh, places to, to send kids that are uh, high quality. Yeah. If I could, uh, Michael, are you willing to share like uh, your uh, impressions of the governor's or the executive branch's uh, appetite for um, potential future bonding to support school construction? I mean, it's kind of a kind of a wordy question, but I think we kind of get the idea. Is there an appetite to engage bonding for? Yeah, I, I don't know um, what they're thinking. I, I sit on um, the Capital Debt Affordability Committee. Um, in our last recommendation um, that was presented to the legislature, the overall debt amount was lower than the previous biennium. Um, so we'll again consider that uh, probably late fall, I think. Um, and so then uh, that, that might take into consideration. There's a number of metrics that are looked at at that time. It's kind of a punt. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know is, is I guess, the short answer. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, so. yeah. uh, this would be easier. I think, I think the general concept that's really important for us is that we benefit from the state's rating we can issue more debt for school construction than can the state without rating consequence. So keeping the state's rating as high as possible allows us to do our work at the lowest cost. And we have the ability to leverage this, to literally leverage the state's rating um, several times what the state could directly. Great. Anything else? Thank you. Mr. Gaughan, thanks a million. Appreciate your patience with us. No problem. Thank you for all the work you do. Take care. Right. Thank you. So, Mitty, anybody, so we'll ask that to make those uh, edits. Anybody want to hear from anybody else on this? Or I think we're pretty in pretty good shape to move it, uh, look at it again, but move it Friday. You're talking about school construction. School construction. Right. Okay, everybody's good. Okay, great. Ask Beth to make those edits. And then as soon as uh Mr. Uh Representative Conlin comes down, the last part of our day is just to have a conversation with Representative Conlin. He might bring uh Rep Brady as well. They have a some ideas for a blue education blueprint. We're just gonna get the sort of overall, sort of their overarching thoughts. 
So we're not completely surprised when we see the final language, but to Ms. St. Jane, oh, yeah, perfect timing. Oh, really great. And Representative Brady, and I just said that he may be joining us. Yeah, oh, let's yeah. give the good chair to Representative Brady. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's be real here. And uh, <laughs> Peter, you can sit wherever you want. goes every day. If you want to. Yeah. <laughs> okay, 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 right. Oh, I want that one. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, great timing. We just finished uh, looking at school construction. Oh. Prior to that, a oh. uh, little bit on OCs. What we settled on now for the last bit of our day is we're not going to go into language, uh, but we would love to know what you're all thinking, some of your ideas generally yep. about what we're keep referring to as the education blueprint. Uh, and this we know is in the yield bill. Yep. We're going to likely have a joint hearing at some point with Senate Finance. Okay. We know what's really in it, Great. but um, we know it has a number of stops before it yep. So tell us about what you're thinking. Although it's made it further. It's now straw pulled out of us and made it through Costaways and Means. So it's right. kind it's of doing appropriations, and then we'll be on the calendar Tuesday. Great. Or, yeah, yeah, for so it is, on, it is yeah. on the Ways and Means website yep. yeah. for today. First version of the one. But okay. even before we yeah. get into language, just sure. give us your big overarching thoughts on what you're trying to do, the, the problem you're trying to fix. The problem we're trying to fix is everything. <laughs> so uh, this, the, the work that happened in our committee that's now folded into this and got some made, there were some changes by ways and means, was really uh, our sort of not at any means perfect, but best stab at everything we've been hearing and taking commit uh, a lot of testimony on since mid to late January in terms of kind of where we sit in a sort of crisis slash inflection point in education right now, knowing, you know, from the December 1 letter, knowing um, kind of the budget forecast had um, high property tax increases and, uh, you know, sort of, I would say, elevated public rhetoric around kind of what's why is it? What's going on? How do we get our arms around this? Where are we going? Um, and so we've taken a lot of testimony. We had a couple of long joint sessions with Ways and Means to try to be more collaborative along the way to, to really um, try to keep things from just being siloed in terms of finance and education and hearing again and again from the field that you know, we were using a lot of sort of finance tools and that's often been the easiest thing at the disposal of the legislature. And that doesn't necessarily drive educational policy or outcomes uh, as clearly as we might want it to. And so, um, you know, hearing from administrators, school board members, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, we had a joint hearing where we heard from over 20 House members from both sides of the aisle, from all parts of the state, sort of what is happening in your communities, what are you hearing, what are the concerns, and what are sort of the hopes for where we're going. Um, and I think we were very stuck. Uh, I think all of us probably are between the go fast, we have to do something now. Um, and you know, we continue to see budgets fail. There's a we have huge challenges ahead of us right now. We have a whole bunch of schools that still do not have a budget for next year. Um, and I'm sort of interpret yeah. pretty, but were you thinking really cost containments when you put together the blue the, the blueprint or tell you know if I can interrupt, I, I, I would just say that uh, what we heard over and over again is if we're gonna if we're gonna make hard decisions and um, you know go to the areas that we know are hard to talk about because that's what, all we got left. Uh, we need a vision. We need to have a direction where we're all in the boat rowing together because it's a lot better. To, it's a lot easier to get people on board for some of the harder conversations if we all know there's an end point that's going to make our system better, more efficient, and responsible to taxpayers. Okay. And to that, I think, you know, we heard in terms of what are the cost drivers, there are some newer um, and more acute cost drivers this year or in the last couple of years, the loss, the ending of federal funds, despite extraordinary student needs in schools, um, the uh, teacher contracts that were negotiated during a really challenging time in schools of high inflation and a lot of um, turnover in the field. Uh, the increasing, as you were just talking about, facilities needs at our schools that have accumulated, 
um, <clears throat> as well as long standing, we have a very uh, big system for a small state and small number of students. We have a lot of buildings. It's very, de very decentralized. Yeah. Um, and that does not lend itself to efficiency and economies of scale. So sort of the combination of short term and long term cost drivers and um, outcomes and outcomes, you well, know, let us again and again and hearing from the field, you know, that the, the real solutions here aren't Quick. They, as much as we all, from a public, you know, taxpayer perspective, certainly want to be able to flip some switches fast, um, that is not necessarily going to get us anywhere in the long run. Um, and we're maybe at a point more than ever. And I would say what was really compelling is what we heard in committee a lot is more people kind of saying the hard things. You know, saying we need help. We know in some communities we're operating too many buildings and we need to consolidate a couple of elementaries. But when left to local voters, that's the heart of their community. These are their kids. It's a long history and tradition. You know, the, the will of the voters doesn't always align with the uh, educational outcomes we might be seeking or the fiscal capacity we have as a state. So, and that's only one example. It's not just about small schools. But again and again, we heard the sort of, we need a little, we want more <laughs> over, so we want more sort of direction from Montpelier and a little less local control because we actually feel like we have less local control than perhaps the sort of biology of Vermont is and state you know state decisions and and mandates have also trickled down in our own budgets and they can't control those um and so you know that that compounding frustration of feeling like so much of what's in our budgets is out of our control and yet we're trying to write fiscally um you know uh, sound budgets and sell them to the public so it was really again like months of testimony, a very, very, you know, I think we continue to struggle with like, do something now and do the right things well to really lead us in a better direction for the future of education in this state in a more coherent way. And out of perhaps crisis is an opportunity to do that. Um, and we've heard that phrase many, many times. <laughs> and uh, uh, go on, Sarah, do you like to go ahead and jump in? Do you want a question or? I'm just, just going to make some comments so I can yeah. wait till I'm okay. representative. Then I was going to say, it's sort of another example, and it's in there. You know, it's like, what is the role of the agency of education? You know, it's, it's largely a compliance agency. And when we talk about gaining efficiencies, you know, Act 173, the special education bill that became an act, and everybody liked it, but it was really predicated on uh, professional development in our schools to bend the cost curve on special education. And you know that's a role really of the agency of education. Do we have an agency of education with the capacity to take on those initiatives that are really meant to gain efficiencies and bend the cost curve? So one of the things we'd love you to also do again, not digging into it, but mm -hmm. just tell us how you approach this. How you know, big picture. Mm -hmm. How you know, what have you put on the table that? will likely come our way. So we put it all on the whiteboard. First. Yeah. <laughs> sort of, you know, we, with, with the committee, we said, okay, what is everything that we've heard? Yeah. What do we want to put in here? I will say we were not thrilled about sort of creating a task force, mm -hmm. but what we really said was we need to put a lot of really smart people who are deep thinking about this issue together in a room and, and give us the vision that we need. So that's sort of how we approached it. Okay, so we're going to get a task force, yes, basically concept that yeah. we're going to respond. And to. It, Any it, questions? I'm just looking. Should we let them keep talking, or do you want to jump? Somebody jump? Um, jump. I can wait. Okay, I'm just yeah. curious about the task force. Is this this is a different task force than the school construction task force? Yes. And this would be the well, vehicle. It almost had a couple other task forces in it, so <laughs> we got that. But the vehicle to yeah. do this is. It's just via the budget. The yield. The yield. And I will say, so the school construction task force is strictly legislative to come out with you know a bill. Um, this we try to keep as as non legislative as possible. Gotcha. Uh, so yeah, this this commission um, we went about it as a committee of first, what is it that they what are the outcomes that we want from it? What are the charges of the committee? And then what perspectives do we want on it? We kind of worked backwards, sort of backwards design. So the charges that we defined in house education of kind of what are the, the, the bigger buckets of what we've been hearing for months 
in terms of our input and committee that are the challenges and opportunities ahead. And so the four big buckets um, that you'll see are one is um, the first charge is related to governance, exact wording, um, governance resources and administration. Like how is our system currently governed? What is the, the interplay between the State Board of Education and the Agency of Education? And we actually know some of this work was really happening when COVID really disrupted everything, like, you know, Dan French, Secretary, former Secretary French and Tammy Colby have been working on some of that. And I think it really got sidelined by mm -hmm. COVID. Um, but where, you know, where does the sort of, where should some of the decision-making lie? Um, what kind of resources are needed to, to Chair Collins' point that at an agency of education, if we're sort of reimagining our system and seeing a little bit more coherence across the state, is that gonna be, driven by support, technical assistance, and accountability from the agency of education, what kind of staff would that need? Um, so that's the first section is kind of the, the administration oversight um, governance part of it. The second major kind of bucket or charge um, that we created in the commission, again, based on a lot of feedback is what's the physical size and footprint of our system? And we see a lot of overlap, hopefully, here to what's happening in school construction. Um, but in the commission, you know, we specifically call out a, a closer look at how many buildings we operate, um, uh, you know, where, how does the town tuition program fit within our, um, you know, in, within our system, um, and how we disperse dollars and look for its efficiencies. <laughs> yeah, impact of the number of buildings that we operate and the ability to staff them sufficiently. Um, because again, that what, what we were finding in, in a lot of testimony was that in some ways, some of our hot perhaps being overstaffed as a state in education is, is partially just the number of buildings. You know, every time every building has to have a certain number of people in it, and, and we lose efficiencies in that way. Um, the, the role of therapeutic schools, what that kind of where they fit in our system, those are some really high expensive and drivers in our budget, particularly in our Ed Fund this year, um, some uh, out of district placements for the therapeutic. So that sort of size, phys physical footprint of the system was bucket number two. Bucket number three is really what is the role of schools today in 2024 and beyond in a post pandemic world, in a world where um, kids have a lot of social and emotional needs that perhaps we don't fully even understand kind of why and how. Um, and so we're asking, you know, the commission to look at what, what is the role of schools in delivering services? And we see a real um, connection here to the community schools. If we're talking about, and I think both of our committees are, you know, is a model where schools might be the place that some social services or sort of basic needs are met. How is how are we going to resource our system for that? Are those ed fund things? Are those other programs that the state might run or pay for, but could be co-located in schools in order to be more efficient? Um, so what is what is that real kind of role of, of schools as um, as we look towards the future? And then finally, the fourth bucket, of course, is then how do we fund it? Um, and what we heard again and again and asked almost every witness all all um, session was, you know, how would you sequence the work? And, and we kept hearing, figure out the policy, figure out the, the vision and the system of where we're going, and then how do we fund it? Um, unfortunately, we can't like freeze time and we have to keep funding things in the meantime, so that's challenging. But the, the fourth bucket here, and this is where the Ways and Means Committee made quite a few, I think, strong changes, um, is to the Ed Fund and how are we going to use the Ed Fund? What belongs in there and what perhaps doesn't belong in the Education Fund um, that's paid by property taxes? How are we going to continue to um, implement the, the weighting and, um, and the work that's been done there and to continue to look at that over time? Um, and there are some specific sort of deliverables, including coming back to us as a body next year with short-term cost containment considerations that a 2025 legislature could even put in place as we continue on the path. And I'm happy to walk through the deadlines then of hopefully a grander kind of plan and specific policy recommendations from the commission about where is it that we're going um, that's going to be uh, you know right sized for the population we have that's gonna support all students and make more sustainable and efficient use of our education fund dollars and I'm, I can't remember it's the words in here or not, but also hopefully, you know, some stability in, in the education fund and kind of what communities are going through now with revotes 
is so destabilizing to schools and communities that how do we move to something that's far more stable so we aren't um, in such upheaval? Just tell us a little yeah. bit about timing of the, the yeah. whole report when, because that's yeah. a lot. It is. It's a lot. It's a lot. So the general framework here is it's effective on passage. And then I can come back to the question about membership. Um, it's effective on passage. Um, the commission is within the commission. It, it's led by a steering committee of five. That is three of the steering committee members are decided with the, uh, the speaker and the pro tem, and two are decided by the governor's office. That was a structure we borrowed from the Select Committee on Higher Education. We borrowed a few structures there because that seemed to be a pretty high functioning process that the legislature had done. So um, the, the steering committee within the commission really is, is the kind of leading group in this work. Um, they deliver a work plan by next September so that we see kind of how they're envisioning the work. Um, we get a preliminary look at uh, their findings by next uh, January, mm -hmm. and then the final December, January, to double check, and then the final report of all the recommendations comes back to the legislature in December 2025. Um, and within that is a requirement for a pretty robust public engagement process that this is, you know, this isn't just a committee that sits in a room up here, but that there are at least 10 meetings and opportunities for input in different geographic areas of the state, and that there's. Um, we did that with yeah. the Act 250. So yeah, well. so the, yeah, trying to borrow some processes from some other large systems work that have been done. Um, yeah. Senator Weeks. Membership. No. No. Uh, we're all. I think we're close for questions. So I think. Uh, you know, go ahead and talk about it. Okay, I have lost a little bit of my steam, but I think I can put <laughs> some of it back. Um, which was just to say, um, I've been hoping for something like this for a long time. Um, so I'm really glad that you all have done this work. Um, being on a school board, the thought of trying to run a district without a strategic plan is, I, I can't even fathom it. So, and there may be a strategic plan that sits somewhere in the AOE, but it's not one that we all live by right. by any means. So I'm looking forward to, you know, mission, vision, clarity, strategic yeah. plan, that can sort of exist regardless of what happens with the ins and outs of politics yeah. and, and the legislature. Because yeah. we are looking at a $2.6 billion budget yeah. and we are looking at generations of Vermonters into the future. So it's such an important work. And I've struggled sitting in this chair yeah. trying to decide like with PCBs. Yeah. Do we spend $2 million to rent? to remediate the PCBs in this wing when we know we want to tear that down in a couple of years. I mean, things like that where it just didn't make sense. It wasn't logical. So I'm hoping this adds a level of logic and structure to to the work that we do. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to say thank you. Is there, did you look, is there, when was the last time a blueprint was produced in education? Uh, there uh, is, mm -hmm. interestingly, some like, processes that Beth discovered that the state board is supposed to do in terms of a, Every what was it? Years. Yeah, and um, right. what's it called? And we found it. So like they a, emailed one to us from 1971. Well, <laughs> there was one in a few Ouch. years ago, but it was like a page. Uh, <laughs> Beth, may I? Yo, please, please. Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. Section 164A, Title 16, which is in the state board chapter requires state board to adopt through a public process, a statewide strategic education plan to describe how the agency will help school boards to improve student performance. That plan needs to be updated at least every five years. And the goals of the plan shall be to strengthen coherence and consistency among state and local education goals, standards for student performance, assessments, professional development, opportunities and action plans, and to provide support for local curriculum development. The plan shall include information as to the economic costs of the implementation and the education benefits to be derived. So that law has been on the books. It was added in 1997. I don't know if there was a precursor to it. Added in Act 16. The best we could tell, the last version of that was pretty thin. Okay. To not existent, and, and um, I'd have to pull up the specifics to, you know, to say nothing of it being news to most of us. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 that we didn't right. even know that that was happening. Yeah, yeah. That was a great overview. Uh, 
in that heads up in terms of what we're going to be seeing. Uh, do you expect the yield bill to be on the floor too? I think our what we're hearing in the hallway is that Probst has a lot of amendments. Yeah. Uh, so you're a Probst. Yeah. So okay. we don't want to jump into it yeah. too fast. Um, and then the question is, what happens on the floor? So yeah. it seems like we'll jump into the final bill sometime. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. We, we appreciate you sort of, I know it's out of, you know, process. Yeah. So we, we appreciate it, but, but the fact that you're giving us a you're really up. heads up. Yeah. And on a major yeah. distraction. Yeah. 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 Well, our morning committees, as you know, are about to wrap yeah. up soon. Yeah. And that means we won't be in here very long because yeah. the afternoons will be crunched. crunched. Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Would you, might you be able to give us an update on what's happening with the literacy bill oh. at all? Mm. Uh, we are scheduling testimony. Uh, there are parts of it that just seem like no question, and then there are parts of it that we probably are going to have to take a look a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Testimony. Yeah. Cell phones. Well, to the 284. It's 284 cell phones. Uh, we, we were just talking about that. So we, you know, this yield bill stuff, and, and we're now going to start trying to travel. Well, we're going to start turning our attention to what do we do about districts that can't yeah. pass school budgets. So they're kind of on the front burner. Yeah. You know, I'll be honest. As we talked about, it's like, that bill's fine, but we don't have the bandwidth to, to take on the bigger thing, but maybe the, the route we need to go is much bigger than just gathering policies and saying, let's just do it. Let's just go bam. Did you take a look at the original bill? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, we've gotten some testimony. I think if we have time, we'll you know, continue to get testimony that committees, I think, becoming more testimony. interested in it. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's our sort of ability to, mm -hmm. to do it. Probably. I, I just got some testimony on email. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so yeah. the yield bill will continue regardless of the schools not passing yeah. their budgets, correct? Yeah. And that's just yeah. part of the yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it's setting it for next year. Yeah. But yeah, but we are, you know, pretty uncharted waters in terms of the amount of instability. How and, many schools? Um, we now have. Well, I should say yesterday. See, all, only all, two passed in the re votes passed. yesterday. Yeah. There were about eight, six, 12 eight. or so yes. re votes yesterday. Um, yeah. There are several that are still coming up in early May. So, um, yeah. But and, and when you see the whole yield, you know, the yield bill, the whole package, well, I'm not sure exactly what our host preparations will do. There's only 100000 in here in terms of sort of the work for all of this um, organization. So it's not a big amount of money. And, you know, not sure what else they, they will do. But the yield bill itself is, is more than your average yield bill in any given year. And it went through a lot of revision in the last 72 hours or so. But just in setting the yield, you know, our Ways and Means Committee, and I think in coordination with the Finance Committee, has done more in terms of some things around ballot language, some things around excess spending. Um, as we look a year further ahead, some there is there's more substantial policy and, and potential kind of roadmap around some of our school finance and this yield bill. So, um, you know, it's a I would say um, I'm sure it's going to go through some changes by the time it gets to your side, sure. but I think a pretty, um, you know, ro robust, more detailed. It's it's our attempt at answering the moment and realizing probably we can't possibly answer it enough for the reality on the ground of, of failed budgets and what tax rates are. Yeah. And um, so, saying to governor this morning on the yeah. video, he was asked, "Well, yeah. short of that deferred idea that the treasurer kind of yeah. called water yeah. on." What, what should happen when we said, well, we just need to be more creative, which just sort of speaks to the struggle of how do you yeah. answer this quickly and other than throwing money at it. When you all feel, yeah. you're talking about the folks and your colleagues, yeah. that your language, that section one yeah. is pretty well big. You know, we yeah. are yeah. so, you know, we have Secretary Saunders next week. Yeah. Yeah. We have very abbreviated yes. media. Um, and then we're pretty, we see the end. So, yeah. and this is a heavy lift. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. let us know. Yeah. And we can yeah. jump in sooner rather than sure. 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 And I, I mean, I would add in our, from our committee process for house education, yeah. um, you know, we worked really hard. We kind of locked ourselves in last Thursday and Friday and yeah. said, like, just the committee, we are going to work out. 
we had some hard conversations. We reached some real compromise yeah. um, on both sides of the aisle. And then ultimately we straw pulled it again today after Ways and Means had changed our language. Um, and it was, you know, 1110 out of um, House Education. So there's, a, you know, a, a lot of consensus, even if everybody doesn't love it, about hearing, taking the themes we've hear, heard and putting forth the best week process we can um, for, again, a more strategic, coherent, sustainable path ahead. And I just want to say, yeah. I mean, you guys worked on it yeah. for months. Yes. We have a week. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> sure. no promises. Yes. We yeah. will do our best. Yes. I know. Uh, and it's as soon yeah. as it's as soon as you have it, I'll let yeah. you know. Yeah. We will. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We'll do our best. Way, I'll say we, we uh, voted out one twenty today. We're going to vote out one ninety one tomorrow. What's one ninety one? That's the uh, new Americans. Okay, okay. Great. Great. I think they're both uh, Senator literacy because yeah. libraries is upstairs. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. No, yeah. it's not upstairs yeah. next door. Yeah. Next door, yeah. and then uh, cell phones is with you. Yeah, yeah. it's obviously yeah. except those together. But yeah, we're waiting on the administration. Oh, and CTD testimony. Right. We've been trying to get testimony, but yeah. I know they're I know we all, busy with the. Yeah. I know we all want to go. I would process. Yeah. I could go and watch your yeah. tapes of your committee meetings, yeah. but I'm just wondering what people didn't like about the bill. Which one? Generally speaking. The, about the commission? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I think our most, you know, our challenges were really homing in on what are the charges, like what are sort of the, the you know, buckets of work here. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really took, you know, I think, a lot of discussion and, and some of the um, specificity. I mean, I think that we're, you know, we're talking about some challenging stuff here, the size of our system, the number of buildings. I think that's putting it out there, things that are we know are going to be challenging. And then not surprisingly, um, you know, the membership of the commission. Anytime we make a list. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. It's, it's, and the Ways yeah. and Means Committee ended up, we were really trying to stay small. We said small, lean, directed. Um, it has grown uh, in size and compromised with the Ways and Means Committee, and there are now 21 members Ooh. on the commission. We were trying really hard to stay under 15. Um, How many bees do you it have? It has grown a bit. Um, and so essentially, um, there is some representation from all of the bees, from the tax commissioner, um, from the independent school association, um, from there are five legislators on it now. We, 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 had, we had originally proposed no legislators. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that this is a, I would say right now, the membership of the commission is a Compromise between education and, and wage and means, um, but it definitely got larger, Good. and we have to. Leave it there. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. You.